Have you noticed that we are taking ourselves way too seriously in the age of woke ideology? Well, today's guest, John Brannon, has spent 30 years as a stand-up comic, and he's joining me today to talk about comedy as God's response to suffering. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, thank you guys for tuning in today and for just meeting me here at my little corner of the internet. I'm glad you guys have joined me. I know that it's the beginning of the month and I'm going to keep telling you guys this because I want you to to study God's word with me. Moms, we've got a brand new study at Mom Strong International. It just launched a couple of days ago and it is called Irreplaceable, the soul-giving, life-altering role of mothers. You guys, God wants you to be encouraged. And so we're going to spend the next several weeks talking about your role as a mother and why God says it's one of the most important things that you will ever do is raise your children to love and follow Jesus. You guys are going to be encouraged. We're going to be talking about uh, just ideas for you to nurture yourself and your children, body, soul, mind, and spirit. So come along with me at momstronginternational.com. All right, I'm thrilled today to have a new friend on the show. John Brannion is here. And right before we started recording, we were kibitzing a little bit about what's going on in the culture. And you guys are going to be really blessed because you know we live in major cancel culture right now. And nothing can be funny anymore, and yet everything is funny. If we don't laugh, we'll cry. I think you guys are going to love this interview. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Gosh, Heidi, thanks for having me. I uh, I never get invited to talk to people anymore. <laughs> I'm a pretty toxic character these days, so most people have said, yeah, we'll, we'll pass. We'll have somebody a little, a little more uh, controllable. A little so, more controllable. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, you and I— You and I are going to get along just fine. Melissa knows exactly uh, what kind of a guest to put on this show. I'm going to just I want to jump right into this with you because we've watched the the face of comedy and what we consider to be, you know, funny, quote unquote, funny in the culture has really shifted. Long gone are the days of Saturday Night Live and the church lady and all the things that uh, we used to sit around and sort of collectively laugh at. And we were talking a moment ago that, uh, you know, people like Jerry Seinfeld have sort of left the industry and said, hey, you know, we can't we can't laugh about stuff anymore because somebody's going to be offended. Right. Someone's going to stand up in the middle of your stand up performance and start screaming about reparations <laughs> or, right. or whatever it is. What have you seen? You've been doing this for 30 years. That's a long time. What have you seen shift in the 30 years that you've been doing it? Just what you said, that that, that people are. The comedy audience, when I started out, are they're old people now. I mean, they're they were they were young people when I started, but now they're old people. And so, what we have is a is a culture that doesn't know they they generally don't know how to laugh because everybody takes themselves so seriously. Their ideas, their thoughts, their their perspective, their point of view, all of that is deadly serious to them. And if you mock them for their insane beliefs or if you mock them for taking themselves so seriously um they just they don't see any humor in that they don't they they just don't and so when you go up onto a stand-up stage everything is fair game you know when i'm I'm making fun of mostly myself but you can't even do that anymore because people know when i'm when i'm making fun of my own uh foibles they know, oh, I have those foibles too. Now I'm offended because he's making fun of the fact that he has to wear glasses or the fact that his hair is falling out or the fact that he's putting on weight. It does not matter. It does not matter what flaw I'm pointing out in myself. Anybody who shares that flaw is offended uh, on behalf of the entire group of people who share that flaw. Isn't that interesting? You know, we've watched... uh woke culture you know for 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 lack of a of a better word really come after uh people who don't think like they do so if you don't think a particular mm-hmm. way then suddenly you hate that person we can't disagree anymore with and without being enemies if we disagree with somebody then we're an we're an ideological enemy and nowhere is this better seen than in the world of of comedy and right we watched i'm sure you've been watching what happened to Dave Chappelle when he took on the trans community and started actually just telling the truth about what was going on. Uh, right. They they canceled him, but then he came back, and I think people are kind of I, at least what I'm starting to see is I think maybe a story might have a happy ending. What do you what do you make of it? I guess it depends on what you mean by happy. Um, <laughs> the, 
uh, we are we are deeply divided, and mm. this is not a surprise to Christian people. Um, we've been reading that this is going to happen, and Jesus told us, you know what they they hate my guts, and so if you guys think that you're going to fare better than me, uh, you're not, and so. There's been a, a, a number of decades where I've been alive and growing up in the church where the church has been kind of getting along, that we've been sort of okay in the culture. And I really think that that means that we've been doing it incorrectly for those numbers of decades because, you know, Jesus told us, if, you know, if, if woe to you if men speak well of you, if, if people say mm-hmm. that, you're, that they like you, then, then there's a problem there. And the church has been for a number of decades trying to get along with culture um, and thinking that if we are if we're just nice enough, if if people like us, then they'll then that we can maneuver them into uh, becoming followers of Jesus. You know, first, first and foremost, before we try to lay Jesus on them, we got to make them like us. You know, so we got we got to put out music that they like. And we gotta do we gotta do sermons that they like. We gotta rearrange the structure of our services so that they feel comfortable and welcome. And then, then once we trick them into liking us, then we can uh, we can throw Jesus at them, and they'll become disciples. And it just doesn't work. And it, it, I I think that we need to just be. Um, I think the church just needs to own the fact that we have taken ourselves too seriously for a number of, of decades now. And we've had Now, what this- do you mean by that? Because there's there going to be people who are listening. What does he mean? The church takes itself too seriously. They're going to be like, listen, dude, this is life and death. It is serious. What What do you what do you right. mean by that? I mean, I mean that it just the very idea that our ministry, my ministry is life and death. And oh, my gosh, I've got to get out and get this gospel to people. Because it is, it's the only thing that's going to save their souls. And while that's true, it's a little bit presumptuous of me to think that I'm going to do it uh, more effectively than the apostles did or than than Jesus did. But that has been the attitude that a number of of my brothers and sisters have had over the years. I've grown up in church. I know I know the church culture, and there was a. There was a time when church comedy wasn't allowed in church. I mean, I, I've been doing this long enough that I remember when well, we're not. There, comedy is no place for the church. I was I was on the tail end of that, um, and now there there was a period through the '90s and in the early 2000s where comedy was kind of a hip and cool thing, you know, in church. But even then, it was couched in a lot of places where. This is something you can bring your non-churched friends to. You can bring your non-churched friends to church, and they can laugh at this. And I was told more than once, okay, no gospel. This is just going to be a night of laughter and fun, and we're not going to we're not going to present the gospel tonight. All, all of that is still the same problem. It's still the church taking itself too seriously and thinking that they know better than God. It's like, you know, this is not the right time for the gospel. And so now we're into the late, you know, we're into the 20s and 2020s, and <clears throat> you still do comedy in church, but but now the church doesn't want to touch any of the subjects that that the culture is offended by. And so you can't talk about, you, you, you can't talk about, uh, LGBT stuff. You can't talk about divorce. You can't talk. You can't talk about anything that's going to offend the non-church people in church, and that's that's the crux of it. We we're, we're still taking ourselves entirely too seriously. We're still worried that people are not going to like us, and if they don't like us, then we think that that means they're going to reject Jesus, and it's it's all completely backwards. Boy, you just there's so much here to to unpack. I mean, like you, you know, I grew up in the church. My husband was a, a pastor for 20 years, so we spent a long time. Uh, you know, we used to, Jay and I used to say, uh, "Ministry would be great if it weren't for the people." You know, <laughs> just yeah. really the, the sort of back and forth of working inside of a church as a vocation. 
But what you were just talking about reminds me a lot of the Willow Creek model, right? Willow Creek came out and they were one of the among the first to say, hey, we're going to we're going to change what we do to become palatable to the world. Right. So we're going to set up a food court. We're going to change our music. We're going to change the style of of uh, of preaching that we do. This was Bill Hybels big thing. Well, then 25 years later, Bill comes around and goes, then work. It's not working. And I think that's where we are right now. I mean, the best model that we see in scripture, obviously, is Jesus and how right. Jesus interacted uh, with people. And he never sacrificed who he was in order to to make friends. In fact, he said, listen, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And we know that the message of the gospel is foolishness, the Bible says, to those who are perishing. And at the same time, you know, the church is struggling with offense, which the Bible says the Greek word, I think this is so interesting, for offense is scandal on literally the part of a trap where bait is hung. And it seems to me that even in the church, we're taking the bait. 20 years ago, when Jay was really, you know, in the throes of full-time pastoring, one of the things that we observed was that the church felt more like a country club than it did, you know, a place where lives are getting changed. And we're actually going outside the four walls of our church. The, the goal was not to stay inside the four walls of the church and have the church grow bigger and bigger and bigger. The goal right. should have been to get outside and to influence culture. Christians should be in comedy. They should be in politics. They should be in medicine. They should be in music. They should be everywhere. We're called to be in in the world uh, and not of the world. And I think in large portion, we've stayed inside the church and we become this giant echo chamber instead of actually making our uh, our faith, you know, putting feet to it and having our faith be a faith that speaks. And I think part of that, too, is we have been infected for lack of a better word, it's sort of this cancer that has metastasized inside of our churches as to we care more about our feelings than anything else. So feelings are paramount. It's our, it's, uh, you know, as Ben Shapiro so often says, you know, facts don't care about your feelings. Well, the gospel is fact, right? So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some people are going to be offended by that. You know, you could tell somebody, uh, like there, we had a, there was a discussion on my show a couple of weeks ago about, uh, you know, the the evangelical that's deconstructing his faith right now. So we see this, the ex-evangelical movement, the deconstructing of their faith. We know that there are, are some sort of well-known, at least in in my circles, well-known uh, Christians who've decided, no, I don't need that anymore. The the Hindus think that they have, their, they've got the way to God and the Buddhists do. And what makes you special, right? right. And we, for, we don't understand the, the basic message of the gospel anymore. Right. No, that, that's exactly right. Relativism is the uh, religion of the age and everybody has their truth and the the average church person the average christian person sitting in a pew is not equipped to respond to that because we are about 30 years or 40 behind the times we still think that it's that it if you just go out and share jesus with people um the culture's completely moved on from that there's there's not a single person in the United States anymore, who hasn't heard of Jesus? It's the opposite problem. They they think they know who Jesus is because they have constructed him out of um, pop psychology and um, a pop culture and and music and beer commercials and uh, all of these memes on social media. Everybody has constructed their own Jesus, and the church people um, just don't know how to how to talk with those people because the the first thing that they will tell you is uh, because they take themselves too seriously is they'll get upset with you and they'll say, how dare you tell me that I'm not a Christian? How dare you, how dare you suggest that, that you're right and I'm wrong. And that shuts 90% of Christians down when somebody says, so you think you're better than me? So you think you're right and I'm wrong? 90% of the Christian people go, Oh no, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm not saying I'm not saying that I have all the answers. And so my response has been over the past five or six years, if somebody says, so you think you're better than me? I go, yeah, absolutely. I'm better than you. And not just a little bit better. I'm way better than you because and then I will go into I'm, I get to be at the table of the creator of the universe for all eternity. What have you got going on? I mean, what have you got going on that's better than that? <laughs> But most Christians are not are not prepared or willing because it feels arrogant 
You know, it feels like it's, it's arrogant, isn't it, to say that my beliefs are better than your beliefs? Isn't that isn't that arrogant? It's like, well, yeah, it is arrogant. Was it arrogant of Jesus to say, I'm the way and the truth and nobody gets to God except through me? Was that arrogant? It kind of was, I guess, if you want to use that word. But if it's the truth, um, then you got to you got to deal with well, it. Well, I think it's if, if it's the truth and it's spoken from a heart of just telling the truth, arrogance belies an attitude. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life, what he was really doing was was saying, I, I love you. I'm going to help you. You know, mm-hmm. I'm the way you guys are looking for the way. I'm the way I'm the door. I'm the one. Right. So arrogance is an attitude which Jesus didn't have. When people look at the, the modern day Christian who who goes to share the gospel and mm-hmm. he says, listen, I appreciate that you're a Buddhist, but Buddha's dead. <laughs> and. Jesus is the only one that came back to life. We serve the living God. They're going to come back at you and they're going to have all the reasons why you're wrong and they're right. At some point, we have to rely on the Holy Spirit. You know, we say what we know to be true. We love the people that we talk with. And then we allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. And I think we assume on ourselves, we take on too much, right? And we yep. decide it's it all depends on me. It, it, it depends on no what depends on us is our obedience, right? We're, right. we're called to speak the truth in love. We're called to be a salt and light, right? Jesus said that he is making his appeal through us. Come back to me, right? This is the heart. This is the heart of God. And instead, instead of, in, instead of trying to uh, engage the culture and say, come back to me, he loves you. He loves you. We're trying to say, Hey, look, our, we're as cool as you are. We, right. we're, you know, we're cool too. Come over here and be cool with us. And it, it's not, it's no different from the world. It doesn't resonate. You've spent, you know, 30 years in comedy, and I want to touch on this because I think it's so interesting. Before we were starting, I asked you how comedy had changed, you know, from when you when you first started and kind of went out on the circuit to, and it, you know, to now where mm-hmm. people get canceled. I mean, there's Saturday Night Live is a joke now. It's not even it's not even remotely funny. It's just a it's just a political. They're just political hacks, right? They make fun of people, but it's not really funny. And you've mm-hmm. seen this shift in the church, and you said something to me, and I thought it was so interesting because I'd never thought it this way. I mean, I said to you, hey, you know, the Bible says that laughter is good medicine. I like a good laugh just like anybody else. And you said that comedy was really a response to suffering. God is the creator of comedy. And right. I, I, I was sort of stunned by that. And then I was like, oh, I, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way. Such an interesting way to look at it. God knew that there was going to be a lot of suffering in this world, right? And mm-hmm. what did he give us in response? He gave us the ability to to laugh at ourselves right. even. Yeah, yeah. well, and you, you have to be, it, it's a nuanced conversation. Um, but the, the shorthand for it is comedy is connected to pain. Mm-hmm. And you cannot have comedy unless somebody is falling down. Somebody is slipping on a banana peel. Somebody is getting a pie in the face. Somebody is embarrassed. Somebody is going through some sort of humiliating experience and you watch it from a distance. You know, it's not happening to you, but it's happening to somebody. And that's the truth that that comedy, there's nothing funny until somebody is suffering in some manner. And mm. the, the reason that God uh, gave us a sense of humor is because he knew that from time to time we were going to be the ones slipping on the banana peel. We were going to be the ones getting the pie in the face. And so you can, when you watch it happening to somebody else, if you say, oh, that was hilarious. But when it happens to you and you're like, and you're like stop laughing at me, that's not funny. Well, that's called being a hypocrite. That's called, <laughs> that's called changing your standards um, based on <laughs> your own personal <laughs> point of view. And so what we have to do as Christians is just acknowledge, first of all, we have to understand that comedy is going to be found where there is suffering and no place else. And so the good news is that the greater the suffering, the the more uh, powerful the the comedy, the more powerful the potential for laughter. And that is not Again, that's not my rules. I just like we didn't write the Bible. I didn't make up these rules. This this is universal laws like gravity and magnetism. The law of comedy is that there's something 
tragic has to be happening in order for comedy to exist. And so once you, once you know that, once I finally understood that, there was a lot of tragedy that was that went into my life. And now it's still painful and it's still suffering sometimes. But but now I know, okay, this is going to be redeemed because this is going to be a great story. Somewhere along the line, I'm I'm going to figure out, God is going to reveal to me what's funny about this. And now I have something that I can tell on stage and and it's going to make other people laugh. And that's that's God. That is that's how he works. He can, he, the scripture talks about everything, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And he, and you, at one point you go, how can that happen? You know, how can this, the world is so bleak and the world is so dark and the world is so awful. How can God possibly redeem this? Well, I'll tell you, there's little, little glimmers of that redemption in comedy. And once you, it's not always easy. But once you realize that this is going to be a good story, this is going to be a story that's going to make somebody else laugh later on, um, you don't suffer as much. You just, you don't have as much tragedy. I think that's true. It's certainly been true in my own life. I spent a lot of time out on the road speaking to audiences and and some of the funniest stories I like to tell came out of the hardest parts of our marriage. You know, things that, right. that were the most difficult about raising children or the most difficult uh, aspects of homeschooling, you know, our seven children. I always like to tell moms now, like, you want to find out how completely wicked you are? Homeschool your kids. Like, yeah. you're going to know. Inside of five minutes, you'll be like, wow, look at me. I'm a very wicked, evil person. <laughs> I and am how a do you, beast. I am a beast. And how do you find, how do you find that out? I behave in a way that is unseemly, you know, or I say something to my children. I'm like, I cannot believe that just came out my mouth. Right. You know, and I think it's true. You know, we have to be able to laugh at ourselves. I think I told you uh, at the onset of the show, I like to tell mothers, listen, uh, raising children is hard. At some point it has to be funny and we need to be able to step back and laugh at ourselves and realize, okay, if I can get through this, God's going to teach me something. And I'm yeah. going to be able to come back later and minister to somebody else who's in exactly the situation and say, oh, man, hey, I've been there, too. You know, uh, you're at the end of your rope. Tie a knot and hang on. Yeah. Well, and it, it is. It, 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 that's the takeaway, I think. Um, I, I talk about this on in my show. But if you can just remember that when you're going through something and it's awful and it's terrible, if you can just remember that this is going to be a great story later. You w- you mm. will you will get through this, and it will be a story that you will repeat. And the truth is, people are really not interested in success. They're, people so are not true. interested in in your victories. No, nope, you know, they're people, not. They want to see you fall on your face. Yes, that's what they want. And people it's and true. people want people will come to you. They make entire <laughs> videos, the the fail videos on YouTube. You know, and it's like, so you've got, you got two videos that you could watch or you could share. One of them is a guy getting a trophy or his high school diploma. And the other one is that same guy getting hit in the crotch with a football. Guess which one is going to get shared? (laughs) So true. No one wants to see you get a high school diploma. No one wants to see you win a trophy. No No one wants to see you get an award, but it is a gift. And I'm, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic about this. It is a (laughs) gift from God. When you are having a bad day, when yeah. when things are going off the rails, that is God saying, "You know what, my child, I'm taking giving yourself you, too serious." Well, He says, "I'm giving you a gift here. This is going to be a story <laughs> that you're going to be re- re- able to relay to other mothers, other other family members. You're going to re you're going to replay it over and over with your kids. There was a day when you did a, th- and and then you're going to tell that story over and over and over and over again. It's a gift." The, it really the tragedy is. and the suffering is a gift from our Heavenly Father. Yeah, it is. I, I haven't often looked at it that way, but the more that you're talking about it, the more I'm like, oh, my word, like half the stuff that I love to share on the road are just, you know, failures and foibles and, you know, all kinds of things that that I learned mostly the hard way. And one of the things that just kind of sticks out in my mind years and years ago when I started kind of accidentally building a platform, I'm kind of an accidental homeschooler, sort of accidentally got a platform. And I was trying to encourage these moms. I'm like, hey, guys, got this homeschool thing. I got my, 
you know, dinner's in the crock pot. And, you know, because my husband had called and said he was bringing somebody over for dinner. So I'm like, okay, I got this thing. You know, I'm trying to wrangle five children at the time. And about four o'clock, I realized, why does my house not smell like chicken enchilada? Something, <laughs> something's not quite right. So I just remember just like, oh my goodness, I, I go over to the crock pot and I realize I never plugged the dumb thing in. So I turn it up on high, did the whole thing. And I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do? What can I do with two, two cans of a green olives and uh, some tomato paste? Quick. I mean, hurry up. That's all I got. That's all I got in the, in the pantry. And I realized dinner's ruined because I don't have time now. Right. So I, I don't know what else to do. So I get on my Facebook page where earlier that day and I'd been so triumphant, like, here's this recipe for chicken enchiladas and stick it in your crock pots. You guys are going to have a great night. And don't forget to do this and that. And the other thing with your kid. And I got on there. It's like, hey, you guys, listen. I forgot to plug my crock pot in. And what can I do with two cans of green olives and tomato paste? And like 10,000 people liked it. Nobody cared. <laughs> Nobody cared that I, you know, at eight o'clock that morning, I had a plan. But when my plan fell apart, everybody liked it. Why? Because we can identify with that. Right. We, everyone can identify with, oh, man, she forgot to plug the crock pot in or, you know, or your kid just, you know, wet their pants walking down the aisle in the grocery store or whatever it is. We can identify with that. And I think that humor and being able to laugh at ourselves and saying, hey, this isn't, you know, I love that. I love that you said it, God's going to give you a story that he really does work all things together for good. It's so encouraging. It's 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 absolutely true. My entire comedy career is based on just telling people basically how stupid I am and how many mistakes I've made. And that's <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. It's it's not me <laughs> pontificating about all the insights and the wisdom and how smart I am and how, what a winner I am. It's just story after story about my dismal failures and my uh, suffering. And that's yeah, it. And, that's my whole and career. And you know what? That's also where community is found. Like in just the, you know, keeping it real, you know, and saying, hey, this is, life is hard, but we we're here to say, Hey, there's a good God who loves you. And one of these days, he's going to make all things new. And I don't know about you, my friend, but I am living for that day. I'm living for that, you know, not living for this city. We seek a city to come. And at some point, uh, I really do hope that the church can start <laughs> laughing again, or at least being honest about what it means to uh, to walk with the Lord, because we really do have the hope, you know, we have the hope of heaven inside of us. And it's a message worth sharing. And this is the time. There's never been a better time to share the gospel. Now's the time. I hope. Uh, I hope you're right. I hope that the that this all the the God comes back and and all of this, all of this stuff blows away. I'd kind of like for this podcast to air before that happens. <laughs> think, is that selfish? Think, is that wrong think, of me? To... I think the odds are ever in your favor. <laughs> yeah. And and All if right. the Lord comes back, you won't you won't care, so it won't matter. So it'll be fine. Yeah, that's probably true. I would <laughs> John, where can people find you online? Good question. Uh my website, johnbranion.com, B R A N Y A N. And what com. what neck of the woods are you hailing from? I am in Indiana. Smack dab in the middle. Well, John Brandy, it's been a delight to have you. Let's do it again Thanks, and uh, stay out there because we we need we need more people like you who are bringing a little levity to the situation. I really appreciate your honesty. Thanks for coming on the show. You bet. Thanks for having me, Heidi. You're welcome. For more information on my guest today, you can go to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash podcast. You guys scroll down to the show notes and I'll link back to John in the show notes today. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for listening. Love your people well. I'll see you back here again at the intersection of faith and culture.